Hello, I'm Brian Gavin, founder of Brian Gavin Diamonds. Thanks for joining us for our monthly Instagram Live video today. We're answering some of the most frequently asked questions on synthetic diamonds. Please remember to leave a question for us uh, for the chance to win a surprise piece of jewelry from us. So put this, please send them in. Okay, I have some questions. Um, and I will go ahead and uh, sort of, I will, will of course answer those questions and let you know what they are. And let's, let's try and proceed. The world of synthetics. Are man-made synthetic or lab-grown diamonds real? Okay, well what are they? Are they synthetic? Are they man-made? Or are they lab-grown? Well, all the above is true. And the difference between that and, let's say, real, is of course real is formed by Mother Nature and lies deep in the earth or is in an alluvial situation. The labs have two different methods of creating synthetic diamonds. I like to use the word synthetic because it is a synthesis. It is a process of creating crystallized carbon. And so the two methods are HPHT, which is, stands for high pressure, high temperature. And then there is CVD, which is a carbon vapor deposit. They are two different kind of methods. As, as, as the words, I think, explain succinctly, you have a lot of pressure in, in a crucible uh, where you have a molten uh, recipe of uh, carbon. And there is, in all instances, we need a seed to actually start the growth of those diamonds. Now, that seed could be natural diamond, which in most cases it, it was to start. But once they've produced enough synthetics, they can use the synthetic as the actual uh, activator or the seed. In the carbon vapor deposition, there again, it's done in a chamber where you have a heated plasma or gas of carbon and it will then deposit a layer on that seed one layer at a time until they grow a big enough uh, a diamond so the question are they real yes they are real they're real diamonds the only difference there again i'm going to say is that they've been created by man in a laboratory situation in controlled conditions to to mimic or to duplicate the real type of diamond that we found, found naturally. All right, let's have the next question. Thank you. Okay, can a jeweler tell that a diamond is lab grown? The honest answer is no. No, we can't because we're looking at diamond. Remember, it is diamond. And even in synthetics, you may have inclusions which look just as much or just as equal as to natural inclusions. So it's very, very complicated. So what are we going to do? Is that the end of the world? Absolutely not. I think we should remember that at, in the late 1800s, a man named Verneuil created a process to duplicate the manufacture of corundum. Yes, it's an old process, but um, it's synthetic rubies and uh, sapphires have existed for over a hundred and what's it nearly 200 years so it's 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 really did that affect the ruby and the and, and the sapphire market no absolutely not did it take some of the position or did it take some of the market share yes it did uh, you had the creation of synthetic emeralds okay there again a complete lab grown emerald um, having the same uh, properties as natural emerald. Did it destroy the emerald market? Absolutely not. Did it take market share? Absolutely yes. And so I think it's really important to understand that these, uh, these synthetics or man-created gems will take part of market share, but will it dominate it? I don't believe so. I really don't. I think that most people prefer something that is natural especially when it's a a expressing a term of endearment expressing your love to somebody else and creating that union or connection between the two of you and representing that union and that love that one one that we show each other so i you know in my 
my sort of doing my own market research with all our clients and people who come into our office, I always ask the question, would you buy a synthetic? And I can tell you now, 9.9% .9 of the time, now maybe it's loaded because people are coming to buy from me, but 9.9% .9 of the time, people tell me they would prefer to have a natural diamond if they're going to get married and it's being given to them. So I think it, it does have greater symbolism. Um, I think that the synthetics are just uh, sterile. Um, yes, they're diamonds. And I think the interesting thing also is if you step back for a moment and look at our big friends, De Beers, who dominate so much of this market, why did they get into synthetics? And, uh, <laughs> you know, I can't answer that question. I don't work for De Beers, but I think they had a certain fear. I think like most people out there uh, who, who, who deal in, in natural, um, I think, uh, so So really, th they've been involved in synthetics for, for really a long, long, long time. Uh, it goes all the way back to the 50s. They were, they were already making synthetic diamonds with GE, and they were doing it for the purpose of, of basically for, for industrial purposes. Um, because you can build different type of crystal structures within the diamonds in order to use it for different purposes. So uh, it, it is a very interesting field itself. And I think through that, they ultimately created the ability to create synthetics in many, many different ways. Now, what is the long-term aspect of synthetics? Um, I don't see it as, 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 a, as, a, as a huge market. I may be wrong, because there again, as I say, I still think that people will favor, they will favor natural diamonds. Uh, in terms of the synthetics, ultimately, I think what De Beers did was a, a brilliant move, a genius marketing a move from their perspective as being a dominant player in the business. And so I think, uh, and let's just look at that. They're involved in mining of, 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 of rough diamonds. They're involved in selling those rough diamonds. They're involved in polished diamonds to some extent. They're involved of buying diamonds from the market. And they're involved in the manufacturing of synthetics. And of course, they came out with their, their light box, which I think pulled the rug under the feet of many people in the synthetic business. Look. If I took a one carat D flawless, for example, uh, let's say the price of that stone was $16,000 as a Brian Gavin Black manufactured out there. And a synthetic stone came along, one of the synthetic manufacturers, and they sold it probably for $10,000. Well, De Beers launched last month that you can buy the same stone for $800 a carat. Now, that's a huge differential. Now think of all the people who've, in, who've invested or who've spent money in synthetics. They've lost a huge amount of money. So from a financial aspect, it's a bad deal for consumers. It's not a good deal. Uh, it's, it, it will lose value. Yes, some of you are going to say that, well, natural diamonds will lose value also. Well, of course, everybody who's in business has to make some kind of profit. Um, will the value of diamonds go down to a certain extent? But I think the fact that, that the advent of synthetics does us all a favor because there is a shortage of natural mined diamond. And it is projected that, that that availability of rough material will diminish. Now, we can say that natural diamond uh, uh, is a non-consumable consumer item. So there is a lot of it out there. I would agree. But ultimately, as the technology increases in the, the, the manufacturing of synthetics, we will see the cost plummeting either much lower. Because it's just, if you can produce it, it's just a matter of demand and supply. And so what De Beers did was saying, okay, you can buy anything. You can buy a white diamond, you can buy a pink diamond, you can buy a blue diamond, and you can only buy it in fashion jewelry, and it's all $800 a carat, and that's what it is. So I think they brought a sort of reality to that market 
And it's something that's happened when we look at the synthetic ruby, sapphire, emerald market, same thing. Prices uh, just plummeted as you could produce the quantity of it. And I think the same thing will eventually happen. So I think, you know, when you look at it from a, an investment point of view, and I think the other thing which is really important is that, you know, what kind of resale market will exist for synthetic diamonds? And that's the whole, that's a whole other issue. But will there be a trade in reselling synthetic diamonds? Um, no, because I don't think anybody's going to pay a premium if they know it's synthetic. And that, you know, brings us to another question, you know, what is Brian Gavin Diamond's position on synthetics? And it's, let me make it very, very clear, okay? We do not sell synthetics. We're a natural house. We believe in natural diamonds, and that is what we sell. We go to extreme lengths to make sure that our supply chain and that our supply is synthetic free. Yes, of course, all our diamonds will go to the lab for grading. Those labs will examine those stones as they come in, whether they are natural or are synthetic. And so you as a consumer are well protected as far as our diamonds are concerned. And of course, you do have the laser inscription on the girdle, it can always be matched with the document, and it can always be verified with the lab. So you do know that your stone is real. The other question which you may ask is, well, Brian, what do you do with all the melee, all those tiny little pieces? Well, yes, that's a very, very important question, and we have some real strong backup on that. The factory that produces our uh, melee uh, will simply do, well, let, let me put it this way. They develop their own machinery in their own lab to process really thousands of stones a day to make sure that each, every single stone is checked, that, that nothing in their supply chain has been mixed in in any form or manner. So all the melee that we offer has been 100% checked for synthetics. It is sealed from the, the factory, and that seal is opened up in our office. So we, we are guaranteed that what we offer is 100% synthetic free. And that's where I hold, and that's where I think I will hold in, in the future. I've had numerous synthetic houses approach us and ask us to sell their product, and my answer is, I'm a naturalist. I believe in real diamonds, okay? And when I say real diamonds, I mean real natural diamonds. I believe in the mother nature or the creation by mother nature. Uh, I think we have another question there, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad to answer it. Will you go ahead, please? Yeah, we have a question from Elizabeth. She asks, why do we keep mining diamonds if they can be lab grown? Elizabeth, that's a very good question. And, you know, why do we do many things in the world? You know, let's take a, let's take a country like, <laughs> like Botswana. All right, Botswana's only real natural resource is diamond. If you stop the mining of diamonds, think of how many people would be starving in that country. What would you do with those people? What opportunity do they have? You know, it's, uh, this is a very complicated situation. The mining houses have a responsibility, number one, okay, to make sure that they protect the environment and that whatever they're doing is a benefication to the people around that work in those mines and ultimately down the chain of what they do. So I really don't have a problem with mining of natural resources. Uh, those resources are on this earth. They are there for a purpose, but I think there's, there should be responsibility in the handling of that product ultimately. And so I think that's why I see, I, I, you know, people will also say, well, look at the, the, the carbon footprint of the mining. Well, you know, let's look at the carbon footprint of, of, of the synthesizing of these uh, diamonds. You know, how much energy does it really take? Uh, we don't really know all the details. Um, it's not like the synthetic houses are out there telling us, hey, guys, look at our carbon footprint. They're not. And I think that in, in many instances, the this, this scare factor of saying that uh, natural mining is, is, is bad, uh, yeah, it's bad for thousands, 
hundreds of thousands of people who rely on it as their, as their daily wage and uh, their ability to educate their children and their ability to give their children and themselves a better future. And then another question is, how do you explain shape trends? For instance, why did over diamonds become so popular? Oh, <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's, it's a completely different question. Why did oval diamonds become so popular? Um, okay, it had nothing to do with synthetics, that's for sure. <laughs> um, look, shapes are fashion. And, you know, when we look at diamonds and we say, what is the best selling diamond in terms of shape? It's always round. And the majority of stones are sold in round. Are ovals uh, predominantly as popular? Well, I'm not quite sure why you think that. Uh, we don't see that. Cushions are really, really popular. We found that emerald cuts, uh, not because I manufacture them, but emerald cuts have definitely picked up. There's a bigger demand. Ovals are popular. Uh, there is a demand for ovals too, but I don't see it as an outstripping. Uh, of, of other shapes. I think we see an up and down of shapes. For example, princess cuts died a couple of years ago where princess cuts were so, so strong that every second person wanted a princess cut. Today, it's not a strong, uh, a strong shape. Um, it's not a high demanded shape. So I think it's more fashion based. I, thought, I think it's more uh, a sort of that demand is based on that. I hope that answers the question. Um, I want to thank you so much for watching our diamond dish. Uh, if we don't cover your question, send us a direct message and we'll get back, back to you soon. And we'll see you next time and I hope you enjoyed it. Good to see you.